Mike, I'd like to thank you for letting us come along here today. So we're at Pod Point Towers. Absolutely, Pod, headquarters. Your, your, your yes. headquarters, yeah. You started it when? Two, 2009. 2009. So yeah, ironically, before there was really an electric vehicle. Yes, because I'm uh, trying to think, there weren't a lot of... <laughs> I think there was a G Wiz, and I think there were less than 100 Tesla Roadster in those days, yes, but it was pre-Leaf, pre-Mitsubishi, right. pre-any pre yeah. of the modern cars, really. Yes. Um, so it was quite a brave thing to go, oh, I'll, I'll in develop an infrastructure for a product that doesn't quite exist yes, yet. Yes, yes, <laughs> and some of the early sales activity were quite intriguing in terms of trying to explain that you needed a charging point right. for a thing that didn't exist. But obviously, time has been kind to us, so yeah. now we see the mass you know, EV starting to be mass adopted. Right. Um, and electric vehicle charging obviously becoming a very sort very, of hot topic. Very, so, very important topic. I mean, the, the, the key bit of PodPoint is we're what we call mission-driven. So right. we fundamentally believe that travel shouldn't damage the earth. Um, right. And it's my personal view that all entrepreneurs should have some form of social agenda. So if you've got the skills to be an entrepreneur, you should do some good right. um, using those. Um, that sounds and, reasonable enough, yeah. <laughs> and PodPoint's way of translating that is to say, well, we think if we can build a network of electric vehicle charging points, we will enable electric vehicles. And if we enable electric vehicles, then we'll have a significant effect on decarbonizing transport and um, you know, air quality and a number of the other sort of um, uh, emissions-based things get solved. Yeah. Um, so we're very aware that we're not the only player. You need right. zero carbon energy, yep. you need great electric vehicles, yes. and you need charging networks. But we sort of see across each of those three areas now there's real movement there we've really got all three of those things moving forward yeah. solar wind electric vehicles yes. obviously great product now coming through and charging networks like pop point starting to really get some traction in the market right. so did you literally then when you started did you literally start with like one charger somewhere i yeah. mean you had to there had to be the first one that Very started so. so um yeah the first person who ever bought a pod point was tesco's <laughs> so we uh, we installed um uh, this was in 2009 uh, and we installed the very first charge point there was two one at their, each of their head offices they have two head offices Right. And they wanted to drive electric. I don't think they had an electric car, but their right. vision was they could drive between their two electric, their yeah. two offices, um, and that was the start of the PodPoint network in right. 2009. Wow. So, and fast forward on seven years, and we've done 27,000 of the things now. So, uh, you know, it's, it's changed a bit over the years, yeah. but um, yeah, still very much so remember that's, number that's one. 27,000. A lot of those are in people's homes, as opposed to they're not. That's not all public. public Absolutely. Accessible yeah. So, so charge. loosely, you've got sort of um, uh, of that split. Two and a half thousand of those are publicly accessible. Two and a right. half thousand are in businesses and the rest then are in private homes. Right. But our, our view is that um, home charge is the biggest part of charging. Yeah. So 60% of all charging we think will happen in the home. Um, the next biggest bit is going to be the workplace. So 17 million of us drive to work every day. So somewhere in the region of 30% of all charging happens there. Right. And then publicly about 7% and then rapid charging about 3%. And that's on an energy analysis of where the energy gets transferred. That is really interesting. So, and, and that, because everyone who, you know, when you talk to people who haven't got an electric car but are interested in it, they always want to know about rapid charging and how fast you can, and how often do you use it. And yeah. I'm, I'm always saying, I don't use it that much. You know, when I do use it, it's very useful, but it's not that often. And they're assuming they're going to be using it every day. But yeah. I mean, it's very clear from that that that's not the case. So we, we love rapid charging. We think it's a great thing. But what you actually find is that it's generally people mapping their old behavior onto the new technology. Yeah. So the old behavior of how do I put energy into my internal combustion engine vehicle feels a bit like a rapid charge sort of solution, yes. doesn't it? The petrol pump looks a bit like the rapid yeah. charger. But the reality is, if you've got charging everywhere you go, so your home, your work, and your public location, your car is always full when you get back to it yeah. and actually then if your car is full every time you get back to it you don't need to chop top up on route very often um, cars not stationary for 90% of its life yes. um, and that's how it's filling and your experience of you use rapid chargers but it's not the main way you put energy into your car yeah. is talking to all of our members absolutely typical yeah. um, so they look at that as the solution prior to buying the car yes. you talk to them three months later now you've got the electric car how often do you rapid charge once or twice becomes the answer. So it is used, it's an important yeah. part of the network, um, but it isn't the sole part of the network. Yes. The vast majority of energy, we, we put it at 97% of energy flows through the top up charging network, right. which is homework and destination basically. So I love this, this is a sort of historical, this is like ancient history, historical. The right. Point Museum we call it. Yeah, the Pod Point <laughs> Museum. <laughs> That's fantastic, because I mean, I absolutely recognise so that. Was that one of the very early ones? Isn't yeah, it? very much so. So this was actually the very first charge pump we ever installed at Tesco. Oh, that so, was a Tesco um, one? That was the oh, very, right. very oh, same fantastic. one. So, um, uh, okay. you know, that was seven odd years ago. So we replaced it fairly recently and we, uh, we said, well, we'll have that one back, please. And right. that will form part of the museum. Um, but what it really shows, I suppose, is when you first enter a new market like electric vehicle charging, you don't intrude 
to know what the market no. needs. No. Um, so you, you sort of make a stab at it. And actually what you end up doing as a sort of engineering function is you throw the kitchen sink at it. You make right. it do everything for everybody. Right. And what you then learn over time and feedback from customers using it is actually you really sort of nail down on what the real requirement of the customer is. And the thing that we've really found over time is the customer is really looking for simplicity. Yes. And we, we yeah. call it um, friction-free charging. So how do I charge my car with the least hassle possible? Right. And things like locking doors and things like RFID cards and screens and beeping and all right. this stuff, unless it's making the job of charging my car simpler, I don't actually want it. Yeah. So what you're actually seeing over the years is a simplification of the product. Um, eventually getting to Kate Paul here, who is right. the, the, la the latest uh, thing that there's a few thousand of across the country. Right. And on this one now, you're plugging in, your car starts charging immediately, and then you've got 15 minutes to hop on our app and oh, select. So you literally, you I've come up here in my Nissan Leaf, I've got the, yep. the cable in there, I shove it in there, and it will start charging and don't do anything. Absolutely. Wow. So, and then you've okay. got 15 minutes of grace time to get you know, potentially into the building, out the rain, right. whatever it is, and then press claim on the charge right. cycle, and then obviously it charges the rest of the... You know, and it will, but, and, uh, and the, the app will know that this is the charger and me and the... Yeah, so it will, you're, you're, it will say, well, I think you're next to Kate Paul, Kate and you'll say, yes, right. I'm at Kate Paul. Right. Um, and so then you just have to remember the name Kate Paul, which is another reason. An intriguing, uh, you could call it a multi, a bi gender, I don't know what you'd call it, Kate Paul. I don't well, know. There's, yeah, there's all different names, so uh, around the office you'll see. So, a few all, so all the chargers have got different names. That's right, right yeah. So, and if you ever need to talk to us about a charger, you don't need to give us the serial number, right. just give us the name of it because they're yeah. all unique. Right. Um, so we can work out where you are and if we need to help, we can. That's fantastic. And, and the other little bit is at the other end of the charge cycle. In the olden days, you had to swipe some sort of tag to end the charge cycle. Yeah. But why? Why do you have to do that? So we got rid of that. You right. unlock, you just unlock your car, you unplug and you drive off. Right. You don't need to interface with the charge point beyond unplugging. But then could, because that's a, the question people always ask, who don't who've never used them could someone else come and unplug you no so when it's locked we lock it so when your car right. locks we sense that and we lock uh, it into lock the it charge there. point so you right. can't get it out until so it's only lock. when you unlock the car but, then that but you actually as a user you don't notice because if you think about what you do is you walk back to your car you blip it you yeah. open up you put your bag in you take your cable out and off you go yeah. so you didn't actually notice that we locked it while you were away no. to you it was just available when i needed it yes um, and that's again part of this let's make charging as simple so as possible um, yeah. because any complexity any sort of you know detail that you don't yeah. need let's get rid of it and just yeah. make the whole process it, it as simple as possible. if you plug it into that first and the car second or the car first and that second. It doesn't matter. It doesn't no, matter. It doesn't mind. So no, it, that used to be, it was all those things like, oh, which one do I put in first? I there used to be remember. art to it, but there yeah. shouldn't be art shouldn't to it. It should to be it, totally no. simple. Yeah. And I think that's the really, you know, as time goes on, just keep taking complexity out of it and just yeah. make it the simplest experience. So the lab is obviously where all of the next generation stuff gets developed. So, so of course, in PodPoint, we have both hardware and software to deal with. So we have to simultaneously design both the hardware elements and the software elements. And oh. both of those have to work simultaneously together. Right. So I guess this brings you back to your, uh, some of your other things you've done in uh, Scrap Heap Challenge and things in terms of actually building some physical things. Yeah, but this is a lot neater, <laughs> let me tell you. This is, it doesn't smell of burning. Or, and there's well, you not, should never and smell of burning. We've got not, something yes, wrong exactly. if that happens. It doesn't smell of burning and there's no one swearing or throwing yeah. things. All of the electronics which appears in that, we've all designed in-house. All of the hardware, the, all of the casing. Basically, everything you see from our product, we've done in-house. So right. whether you're using the app that's all developed in here or the hardware you're interfacing with. Right. We, we're what I call a completely vertically integrated business. So we control every part of the technology stack. Right. Um, and that means that you know we've got when we want to optimize for the best possible charging experience, we've got control over every element of it. So if we've got a vision of okay, like getting rid of the RFID things, yes. actually So you can do you can work. We can into do that. it because yeah. we get both yeah. ends of it. Um, and we think that's really important. And moving forward, that'll be a key part of right. continuing to iterate and make charging better. So uh, contentious uh, topics are charging for uh, charging for electricity as we've seen recently with a, another company that has introduced charging <laughs> to use their, their rapid chargers because I've heard that argument it's got to be about kilowatt hours I'm not sure it's right so I think there's multiple pieces in there I think yeah. the first thing is that inevitably electricity isn't free so we know that yeah. you know cost per mile of electric vehicle is significantly lower than, than an internal combustion engine vehicle but it isn't zero so I think long term uh, we have to move to a situation where public charging has a cost associated with it um, and I think you will see numerous companies try different solutions before sort of honing down on the per perfect answer. And probably the perfect answer isn't the same everywhere. So if you think of the different places you might charge uh, publicly, a hotel, um, a public uh, a station where you stay for a lot of hours, a supermarket where you're only there briefly, your workplace, quite conceivably, you'll end up with different models across each of those. And my, my personal view is if you talk to the sort of early adopting EV driver about how billing should be, 
they'll often talk to you about, I want it on a per kilowatt hour basis. I want to pay for the exact amount of energy I use. And, and you can understand that. But I think as you then talk to the next range of EV drivers coming in, they're not really minded to understand what a kilowatt hour is. It yeah. doesn't mean too much to them. They're familiar with parking their car and there being a time element to parking their car. So most of our customers at the moment have chosen to go for a time element to the charging. So you pay per minute or you pay per hour. And I think everyone understands that. What we've built in in terms of our company is a system which allows that to change later so if as the world gets more educated on what a kilowatt hour is yes. we could move to that model it's no problem it's a, it's a flip of software away for us right. um, but it's also worth bearing in mind you know the, the old world you know we buy gallons of pe petrol you know we don't want the volume of the petrol we want the energy we don't buy joules of petrol do we yeah. uh, so um, I think you know actually it doesn't always go to the sort of first principles engineering analysis yeah. of how billing should work um, my personal view is overnight a hotel maybe it's per session you pay per evening um, if you're working at Sainsbury's maybe it's per minute um, you know if you're parking at Gatwick or Heathrow it could be quite different yeah. and it really depends on what's the usage profile that I the EV driver I'm going to use at that location um, and in some cases actually the cost of using that parking bay is more significant the energy cost and in some cases the other way around so I strongly think you'll see a range of different solutions and actually long term it's the market that will tell us yeah. what is the right solution so you know I in some ways, I know um, not everyone has been totally successful in introducing billing to charging, but in some ways you have to applaud the fact that they are moving the market forward. Yeah. It does have to go that way, even if everyone doesn't stumble on the perfect solution immediately. One aspect we haven't discussed yet, is, which I would love, is the universal access mm. so that I can use you know, ChargeMaster, PodPoint, Ecotricity, plugged in places. I can't remember, uh, charge your car, yeah. you know, all those ones. But I have one thing, either, either an app or a card or a fob or whatever it yeah. is, so that that I don't, as a customer, I don't have to deal with the intricacies of the network. Sure. So I think the answer is that it's a little bit like the mobile phone networks to when we first had mobile phones and you couldn't yeah. call across network and you couldn't text across network yes. and this sort of thing. It's a, it's a relatively early market dynamic. So the two things have to happen. You have to solve for the now. Um, and our solution for solve for the now is get rid of the RFID card. So get rid of the access thing that you might not have the right one. Right. And almost ubiquitously, if you've got an EV, you've got a mobile phone. Yeah. So that, that gets you there. I can charge wherever I am using my mobile phone. In terms of in the future sort of having a, um, a sort of cross roaming agreement that means that everyone can charge everywhere, I think that is in the future and I think that's real. I think that actually money flowing through charging infrastructure actually is a key enabler for that because the various commercial entities that are involved probably what happens is behind the scenes you have some form of transfer pricing going on and it just means everybody can access everybody else and the consumer wins. I don't think EV charging will ever be a monopoly win situation. There won't be a single person that does all of charging across the whole of England or Europe. In reality probably it falls down to there being two, three or four big networks across the whole of Europe which do all of it. Yeah. And, and that's something we're actually familiar with. We're familiar with you know Vodafone and phones. O2, yeah. this sort of thing. If there are a million electric cars then that's the equivalent to a million, potentially the equivalent to a million new houses, which is a yeah, lot of new houses. Absolutely. You know, it's a huge extra demand. I mean, are you sort of in talks and thinking about how that is managed? Very much so. So, um, you know, the whole, whole of what we do is based around communicating charging infrastructure, so intelligent charging infrastructure. And that's for a number of reasons, one of which is to make sure that we can manage this network of uh, lots and lots of cars charging. So to put some perspective in that, if we all try to charge our electric cars at peak, if only about 7% of the population have got electric vehicles, you get to a point where you've got an overloaded grid situation. If, however, you manage when and how people charge, you can get to materially all of us driving electric vehicles without really doing any significant reinforcement of the whole electrical grid. Maybe in isolation, some small areas, but overall. But when you talk to consumers, they're very used to electricity is there when I want it. And to explain to them in the future that they would need to engage their brain and think about when to use electricity, I, I don't think is real. So I'm a firm believer that it's, it's people like us guys, the charging networks, have to monitor and manage how energy flows into cars. And that will mean multiple things. So the, the really obvious example is when we're all watching a sporting event on the TV and the advert break comes yeah. on, half the UK disappears into the kitchen, turns the kettle on and makes a cup of tea. And what the national grid actually sees is a significant spike in energy utilisation. So they have a whole bunch of short-term generating power stations which they turn on just for this two or three minutes that we're all making tea in the advert break. In the future our plan is we will feed that into the PodPoint network and we will actually reduce the amount of charge just for a couple of minutes that the whole nation 
is doing on their electric vehicles. So you won't then need all of these small uh, rapid generation power stations because we can actually just you know, reduce the net load. So that's the sort of higher frequency management of it. On a, on a lower frequency, you've got to move people from the 630 peak. You know, if we're all gonna get home and plug our car in about home time, which is five till six, and we, we see it on our network, biggest peak everyone right. plugs in after work and you really do see that you we see, see it in the real day. data wow, yeah absolutely yeah. so um if we all did that we'd have a problem so what you actually have to do is you have to build in the technology which allows us to centrally manage and we can actually learn people's behavior and we can understand when do you tend to use your car next how much energy has got left in the battery how much energy do you need and if you need you know, 10 kilowatt hours yeah. of, of energy you probably don't need it at 6 30. if we yes. actually put that into your car at nine o'clock at night when the grid demand is much lower you'd be perfectly happy. But I think if you just look at the, the change we've seen in nine months, if you go from the Frankfurt Motor Show to the Paris Motor Show, I think we've gone from a time where at Frankfurt, I almost had to battle my way through the internal combustion engine uh, cars on any one stand to find a single electric vehicle. Right. And then you map forward to Paris, which was only a month or so ago, and it was completely the opposite round. I had to battle my way through EV to find right. a single apologetic <laughs> non-EV. Wow. And to wow. see that's happened in less than a year is immense. And I know there's been a lot of sort of macro changes with um, um, emissions and a number of other things but I think the rate at which this is coming is quicker than most people appreciate I, I say we're seven years into EV in the UK really and we're at one and a half percent I think you will see us get to 10 percent of new cars are electric by 2020 that's not far off you know that's only sort of four years into yeah. the future and then I think in another 10 years you'll hit 100 percent so my right. personal view is you think there will be once it does that it'll yeah. tip over and, right. and what happens is somewhere around 2020 you get this um, uh, crossover of the cost and the capability yes. of the electric vehicle and you get a 200 ish mile range car costing about 20,000 pounds and that is about where the majority of people start interfacing with the technology so uh, the early adopters will put up with a car which has less utility or a higher price point because they're passionate about it because they believe in it the, the mass market I think needs to see a certain utility level at a certain cost level and to me that's about 250 200 250 mile of range 20,000 pounds that happens in the year 2020 so it's all the twos um, and at that point you see mass adoption of this thing people will see them everywhere and that really makes it so, I mean, a really crucial part of that is to have a sustainable you know both financially and environmentally and technologically sustainable charging network that is fairly ubiquitous and, and the reality is there's a big job ahead of us in terms of scaling this up so and you know whether you look at you know, point alone or the whole industry you know what we've put into date in terms of charging is a minuscule fraction of what we're I mean, going to have to do like over the next you know, 27,000 20, 20, 20, 27, sounds like a lot like loads it must be everywhere you know, we've yeah. got 25 million cars yes. in the UK loosely yeah. you need one each a yes. minimum um, yeah. and, and actually you know when you think about diversity and actually you know it, it doesn't the, those maths don't quite work you yeah. need an awful lot of charging yeah. across not just the UK but the whole of Europe and when you consider that charging needs a product and a physical install to happen it's quite a big challenge in yes. terms of building this. It can't go too far out of sync. The two things can't go out of sync. No, you know, we no. can't go and put charging literally everywhere today. Yeah. You've got to do it. And I, I sort of have a mental curve of the adoption of EV. Right. And either side of that curve is where electric vehicle charging needs to be. So we, we have to sort of work in sync with the rollout of EV. But you know, if, if what I happen towards 2020, it really takes a massive uptick. We're going to be quite busy sticking charge points in everywhere. And hopefully that really helps make the electric vehicle revolution really happen. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Eric. You've been very kind to us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Good, good talking to you. Thank you.